All right, so looking at the balance stuff, let's go ahead and put me up here in the corner and uh, get into that second third of uh, the movement preparation here. So um, if we're looking at it, right, balance, we need to, today we're gonna be describing balance training and obviously the purposes behind it. Um, rationalize the importance of balance training. <laughs> we were talking about this yesterday, but this is the thing that like a lot of folks like to skip, right? I know the balance training sometimes seems really uh, boring because of like it's often thought of as a very very static process um, but that's not necessarily true right like it, it can be a very very dynamic process um, there's a lot going on sort of under the surface that you might not necessarily see when you're doing balance training uh, and then at the end we'll we'll talk about like how to you know design an effective uh, balance program so you know, uh, first we need to understand like what balance is, right? Um, balance is going to be defined as, I want that to be bold. Um, uh, balance is gonna be defined as how far outside of your base of support you can maintain equilibrium, right? So it is uh, the distant, um, how far outside of a base of support an individual and maintain equilibrium. Oh, I spelled equilibrium wrong. I know I had it with the eye. Uh, <laughs> so it is. It is how far like you can maintain your balance. So if I'm, you know, if I'm standing here like this uh, and I stand up on one leg, this is pretty centered, right? Like this is pretty much in my base of support, but the further I take it out over here, right, you'll notice like my upper body leaned a little bit in order to kind of compensate for that leg. Um, that's my balance, right? My, my balance is how far, you know, I can reach outside of that while maintaining proper posture. You know, that's another key aspect to this. You need to be able to maintain proper posture when you're doing this. So in order to have like proper balance, right, uh, we need to make sure that we're developing uh, our sensory motor integration, right? Um, which is your body's ability to sense information coming in, interpret it, and then execute the appropriate response in the opposite direction, right? And like, not just and when I say execute the appropriate response, I mean like recruit the right muscles at the right time for the right amount of force. So that's where we get into the definition of like neuromuscular efficiency. One of our most key concepts as trainers, right? Like we're constantly trying to get our clients to recruit their muscles correctly. Um, you know, right muscle, right time, right plane of motion, right plane of, you know, type of force. Um, you know, uh, you can see uh, there's some always some really fun, interesting examples of like where you see somebody who has like altered neuromuscular control. Uh, you know, like look at your, your biceps always kind of a good example. It's mainly in charge of elbow flexion, but it does do supination as well, right? Like it pulls you know, it pulls your arm into supination. And so it's always kind of funny when you see somebody who uh, might have like altered neuromuscular control, they'll try to do like a bicep curl and you'll see them every now and then also like do this little extra bit of twist. And it's just something that you can kind of notice and you're like, oh, this is somebody who clearly is new to exercise. They know they're supposed to, their body is not used to recruiting this muscle. So it's just squeezing the muscle in any way that it can. That's an example of recruiting that muscle in the wrong plane of motion. You know, we're trying to stay sagittally during a bicep curl movement, uh, but that supination is very much a transverse movement. So balance is a great way uh, to, to kind of develop that because there's so much sensory information coming in, right? Like when you're standing on one leg or when you're standing on a piece of equipment that challenges your balance, that is giving your body all of this information. All this information is like basically bombarding your, your brain, um, <laughs> not like the DDoS attacks like we were talking about earlier, uh, but all that information is like bombarding your brain and your brain gets a chance to like interpret it and like learn it and then it can incorporate the appropriate response later, you know? Um, without proper, I, I can't remember who told me, who said this, it might've been Mo actually, I, I might be stealing this from Mo. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, without proper balance, it's kind of like, uh, or like so for, if you're training an athlete who's never trained for balance, um, it is almost like trying to teach somebody a language, uh, but you left a couple words of the alphabet out. You didn't teach them a few, a couple words. You didn't teach them a couple letters in the alphabet. 
if it was Mo, I am butchering his, his example here, uh, <laughs> right? Their brain didn't get enough information, so it's always gonna have trouble executing the appropriate response. But the more information that it gets and it absorbs, the more it can use that information later on. So those are a lot of things that can uh, kind of contribute to balance and why balance is so important. Um, so we kind of need to understand like how our postural control works. Like obviously the whole key of balance is to like maintain posture, right? Um, well, there's your body is going to use a series of like little tiny adjustments to get your body back into that equilibrium, right? And so there needs to be a couple different things that are going to happen here. There needs to be sensory detection uh, of motion uh, and sensory detection of position. So you need to have proper uh, proprioception. Am I going to get proprioception up here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you need to have proper proprioception in order to be able to have um, proper balance, right? And so like, remember, proprioception is like information coming in. So if we look at, um, if we look at like the two kind of main things that we have a lot of control, I mean, there's a lot of things that contribute to proprioception. Like we kind of boil it down into the basics of like muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs and joint receptors, um, because like those are the most relevant to us. Those are the things that we directly work on as trainers. Um, but obviously there's a lot of other stuff that's related to proprioception as well. Um, so if we look at that, let's 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 look at look at that example, right? Like your muscle spindle is supposed to tell your brain how long the muscle is, right? And your Golgi tendon organ is supposed to tell your brain what level of tension the muscle's at. And then your joint receptors are supposed to sense like how much pressure, acceleration, deceleration, whatever, uh, is happening in that joint. So if any of that information is wrong, right, it would be like giving somebody directions to your house, um, but you just don't know the actual name of the street you live on. Like, you're sure that you live on Franklin when, in fact, you live on Roosevelt, you know? <laughs> like, um, you're like, yeah, no, take a left. My house is about three quarters of the way down. They're like, yeah, I'm here, and I don't see you. <laughs> right? That's, like, a good, that's a good that's, example. <laughs> yeah, man, that's what altered proprioception is like. It's, it's your brain's like, well, then you must be doing something wrong, you know? Like, that's altered proprioception. Reception. If your muscle spindle's like, no, we're at full length now, we couldn't possibly stretch any further, right? Like, then your brain's like, oh, well, we must be in this position, you know? <laughs> like, um, it's gonna have trouble with sensory detection. And so when it has trouble with sensory detection, that's going to affect your sensory motor integration, right? Um, taking sensory information and executing the appropriate motor response. So what's going to happen is you're going to move the other, a different way instead. You're going to recruit other muscles to kind of get the job done. And, you know, it's going to happen, but it's really not necessarily the way your body is designed, right? Um, and that's what normally happens. But looking at in, in like a, doing that in a situation where you're balancing, well, you can understand how that's, you know, going to get you even further and further away from like the way you are designed to move. So then what ends up happening is like, you know, let's say I'm trying to maintain my balance here, right, by standing on one leg. If I start to lose my balance this way, right, like my body knows that it can do a couple things, right? It can recruit my my core muscles over here and squeeze to get me back up. But if it squeezes too much, look what happens. All of a sudden I tilt way over to the other side, right? So it's like, um, we'll make up some number. I always like to use numbers to highlight, but it's like, if I'm tilting this way and I contract my obliques for 10 pounds of force, right? 10 pounds of force is going to throw me way over here. It's way too much force, right? I didn't need 10 pounds. So then all of a sudden I'm off balance this way. So now I got to recruit muscles and you know, I end up like back in the wrong direction over here. So then my body tries like eight pounds of force and it goes and then falls back down. So that's not enough. But then it tries like nine and that's just enough to get me back into equilibrium. That's enough to get me back into neutral balance. But there's other ways that your body can do this. Uh, they're not necessarily the ideal way. I actually experienced it a little bit because I'm on, I'm in socks on a hardwood floor. It was really easy for me to compensate. When I first was goofing, I think you get, can you see my foot? Uh, when I first like went to do my balance, my body went like, it kind of naturally turned my foot out like that. <laughs> and like what that does is like, right, like that 
this is more surface area to contract where my like weight is going, which is sagittally. So like I turned my foot out, which yeah, gave me a more stable base of support, but isn't necessarily an ideal position for my body, right? My body should ideally maintain something somewhat similar to the anatomic position or at least the fundamental position. Um, so that foot turning out, that's an example of like how, you can train yourself to have these kind of bad habits, which can hurt your, your, your balance overall. And that doesn't seem like crazy important when you talk about like your average everyday client, like that's not something that's going to be the end of the world. But if you talk about like training an athlete who, you know, uh, good balance could be the difference between like good defense and, and bad defense. Um, you can understand like how this starts to become super important. Um, so then the other part of uh, maintaining equilibrium, the other part of like maintaining proper posture is going to be executing the appropriate musculoskeletal response. Like if I execute, you know, a foot turnout instead, um, that is not going to be as effective as like, you know, tightening my core, squeezing my glute. Um, if my core and my glutes are weak, you know, my body will just go, okay, we'll turn the foot out. That'll keep our balance, right? That's an inappropriate musculoskeletal response. So those are kind of like parts of our postural control systems, right? So let's talk a little bit about like where we gather our information from. Um, you're going to gather sensory information from a couple different places. Uh, one of them is going to be your visual system. Uh, so literally your eye line is actually going to help. Um, <laughs> I'll have to admit that uh, I was watching, I, I have a hard time watching like videos where people get hurt in, you know, on the internet, like, like fail videos where people hurt themselves. But I will say I have been really enjoying like VR headsets where people, people are like, ah! then they like, fall over onto the floor for no reason. Um, Cause they're wearing like a headset that's telling them they're on top of a skyscraper. <laughs> um, and so that stuff is, is kind of funny to me. Uh, and I was watching some this morning, but you can, I, I was like, I totally get this. Like I totally get why these people are freaking out. Like their brain is being told um, something that is very different than the information that their body is naturally sensing, you know? Um, and so your visual system is a big part of your balance. That's what I'm, I'm glad I watched that video today. It became relevant to today's lecture. Uh, <laughs> but like your visual system, right? Like your brain interpreting like where uh, the sky is versus like where the ground is, like that is definitely part of your balance. Um, I'm going to come leave this middle one here and, and come back to it in just a second. But you've also got proprioception, right? Again, proprioception, your body uh, sort of sensing where it is in space, right, uh, is also going to be a big part of your balance. Um, and so like understanding like what tension a muscle is at, what uh, length a muscle is at, uh, and hey, whether it's accelerating or decelerating, all of that is going to be big, important parts of your balance. And then we got this vestibular one, which is very important, but unfortunately not something we have a ton of effect on. Um, but your vestibular system, uh, so side when you are talking about balance, you're primarily talking about it in three spots. Um, the three main like places that you're going to recruit a lot of like strength to maintain balance, not that it's not happening across the whole body. It absolutely is. But there's three kind of key players. It is the bottom of your foot. Uh, which is always kind of surprising, but the bottom of the foot, your ability to like grip the floor uh, is going to be a big part of your balance. Your core, obviously, right? Like maintaining like your core strength. That's why like it always helps if you are trying to balance to draw your belly button in towards your spine or just squeeze your abs. Uh, that always helps. Ugh. And then the third one, which is part of your vestibular system, is your inner ear, actually. <laughs> um, and that seems kind of surprising, but... Uh, uh, your inner ear has this little bit of fluid inside of it, and it actually has these little tiny stones inside of it as well. And those kind of slosh around, and depending on what position you are in, that actually tells your body where it is, like in orientation to like gravity. So if I go this way, gravity is pulling those stones in this direction. If I sit here, it's pulling it in this direction. So my brain knows that my head's off to the side and now my brain knows that my head is upright. And that's what your vestibular system is. Um, if you've ever heard of somebody who has vertigo, has anybody in here ever known somebody who has had vertigo? Yeah, oh yeah, Maggie, you have, you've definitely had to have bumped toes with somebody who's been hitting the head hard enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 
I've had vertigo like twice. Oh, really, have you? Really light, really light. I've oh. had it once, I think. It yeah. was just from moving in my sleep, you know? It, was, it wasn't It was like from being hit or anything. Yeah, but, uh, it's, it's rough, man. Like, did you get nauseous too? Oh, man. The one time was like really light and the second time, oh my, like I was on a boat, like swishing back and forth. It was awful. awful. Yeah. Did you did you go to a physical therapist? I did. They ended up showing me the lay down the maneuver. I don't yeah, know. crazy, right? That's like one of my favorite. You know what I always yeah. think of? I, I don't know if this occurred to you at the time, but that maneuver is essentially that little steel ball game that you get, <laughs> kind of like a little like twenty five cent vending machine. Yeah. That's yeah. essentially what they're doing. They're just getting the the rocks back in place. Yeah. So they're yeah. using your head. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, so that is your vestibular system. So what will often happen is someone will experience some type of like trauma. Um, sometimes it can also happen from like ear infections. Like if you get a really bad ear infection, uh, that can actually even even kick off vertigo. But usually it's from like uh, like a bike accident or a car accident or, you know, um, sometimes just getting hit in the head really hard. Uh, and so what happens is basically these little stones, which are responsible for your balance, uh, get knocked out of place. And so, you know, um, think of it as like a level, you know, the bubble, <laughs> trying to keep the bubble in place, right? Well, if that bubble is just going all over the place, your brain's trying to interpret that information. So when you have vertigo, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And then all of a sudden it feels like the world's upside down and you can spot somebody who is having a vertigo attack. Um, I don't know if you ever ever noticed this, Maggie or Deborah, but like you can often spot somebody who's having it. Their eyes will do this. Their eyes will dart like crazy, um, and that's their brain trying to be like, "Where am I? Where am I? What you know?" And it's trying to find like a point of reference. Um, uh, and so that's like really what kind of that that's what vertigo is. Um, now we mentioned like. Uh, you know, if you have, it, you can actually, there are physical therapists who sort of know this specific technique and there's a name, the name is kind of cool or maybe, maybe it's not, but um, the name for it is where they basically, it's, it's where they, um, they take the head in this very specific direction because the canal of the ear uh, is actually pretty complicated. If you look at the uh, vestibular ear, um, if you look at this, it's kind of this big complicated, like, maze and tube of tubes that's come on every time um you know all like obviously there's all this but this is actually where all of that's happening right all of this information here. so you got to basically guide this rock through and get it back to where it's like like sitting neutrally um so that's that's really kind of what's going on there uh when you know somebody's going through uh that technique so um so anyway, that is your vestibular system. We don't really have much control over that as trainers, right? We can work on the core, we can work on the balance, um, and hopefully training those things will make that vestibular system, you know, more effective. It'll be able to interpret information much more effectively. Um, all right, I don't know who that is. Uh, <laughs> thought I was a student. Um, so all of that together brings us to understanding neuromuscular efficiency, right? And so neuromuscular efficiency is a big part of our balance. And this is what we are training uh, when we are training in an unbalanced way. We're training for neuromuscular efficiency. So neuromuscular efficiency is going to be the, mm, the ability to recruit the right muscle at the right time for the right amount of force in the right plane of motion. Okay, so the correct muscle, the correct time, uh, the correct amount of force, and in the correct plane of motion. Uh, it is going to allow all of your muscles to do what they are supposed to do, right? Um, so this, what do we say here? It allows your muscles, um, allows your muscles to work together uh, in all planes of motion. So we want to have neuromuscular efficiency whenever we're trying to do anything, you know? Um, this is where 
Uh, I'm going to throw my roommate under the bus right now because we just moved in uh, to this new house. But I was just talking to him about like, you know, like I used to move furniture with my parents. My parents own a moving company. I grew up doing it when I was in high school. I did it every summer. Um, you know, and so like there's there's tricks in the moving industry to carry stuff like much gentler. And uh, I remember like when I was younger, screwing it up uh, when I was like trying to carry stuff and like making you know, the people I worked with, like, super angry. <laughs> um, but, like, when you're carrying furniture, sometimes, like, it's it's tempting to have, like, one arm underneath and the other arm on the back of something to, like, you know, maybe stabilize it. But what ends up happening is, like, that inevitably, like, this is just not as much force because this is, like, external rotation as, like, a force versus, like, a literal first-class lever of just, you know, lifting straight up. So what ends up happening is like you tilt the furniture and then both parties are suffering while they're trying to carry something. It's much easier for both people to go underneath it and just let it kind of hang all the way down here. Um, so I was like, I was like, dude, you got to like push it upright, like stop letting it tilt. Uh, that's making it harder on both of us. And then like, uh, also like later, like going downstairs, I was like, I was like, lift it up like this. Like you're going down the stairs and like you're hunching like this, trying to like maintain your grip. You don't have to do that. Like set it up here. And yeah, it sucks that you're doing a little bicep, but like your biceps are going to burn, but like your back will be upright. <laughs> and so there's little tricks like that. That is the reason those tricks work is because you're drawing the weight of this awkward object closer to your center. And the closer you bring it to your center in like a simple lever, like a first class lever, which is you know, a super effective uh, lever type, um, the lighter something is gonna feel. You're gonna have less torque because it's closer, you know, the axis of rotation is closer to the center. Um, and so like all day I was just yelling at my friends. I was like, I was like, hold it right. Uh, <laughs> um, that's efficient, right? That's, that is what we're talking about when we talk about neuromuscular efficiency. I'm not saying you can't get the job done in another way. And you know, what's kind of weird is a lot of times we as trainers will actually use neuromuscular efficiency in the opposite way. Like a lot of times we'll do make them something less efficient uh, in order to, you know, work one specific muscle uh, by itself. Skull crushers are a great example of that. Like when you do, when you're lifting and you're doing like a tricep exercise like this, we will actually adjust that angle slightly in order to get more of a target on certain parts of your tricep. If you bring it higher, that's going to be much higher on your tricep. And if you bring it lower, close down to your sides, while you're doing just like a tricep extension, that's going to be the short head um, of your, uh, I'm sorry, the long head of your triceps instead. And so we actually make the exercise less efficient movement wise. Um, but what that does, that targets specific parts of our muscles because those are the, you know, we're trying to carve that out. It's very much a bodybuilding thing. Um, which I always laugh at because it's like, oh, of course, in the bodybuilding world, we make something technically less efficient so that we can make it look better, <laughs> um, which is just human nature all over. Uh, <laughs> so neuromuscular efficiency, right? Knowing how to recruit the right muscles. When you train in an unbalanced environment, um, you are training your body to develop more neuromuscular efficiency. You're giving it so much information that it can learn how to do things in the most efficient way possible. So uh, obviously the big parts of neuromuscular efficiency are proprioception, uh, which again, proprioception um, is going to be uh, the, this is the, this is the, the big complicated definition. Um, they don't usually ask you this version, but it is the cumulative neural input from all, and it says mechanoreceptors here, but it's actually from all proprioceptors. Um, I don't know why it says that in the PowerPoint, because in the book, it'll say, it'll say proprioceptors. I mean, I'm pretty confident. I could be wrong. Um, but as a cum cumulative neural input from all like mechanoreceptors, proprioceptors, whatever in the body, you know, telling your body where it is in space, right? Um, that definition's, in my opinion, like not super helpful. Um, but it, the, the definition that I like, it is the body's ability to sense the relative position of adjacent body parts, right? It's your body's ability to sense where it is in space.
that's what proprioception is, right? Your body understanding, oh, if the bicep is at 50% length and 10% tension and, you know, 20% acceleration, uh, I know that I'm currently mid bicep curl, right? Like all that information. Uh, I love the duck analogy when I'm trying to describe what proprioception is. If I told you something has feathers and a bill and webbed feet and quacks, I didn't tell you it was a duck, but like, hopefully you figured it out, right? <laughs> like, you got a bunch of information. You put that information in together to understand what it is we're talking about. Your body does that with its positions, right? It takes information about what that muscle is, what that muscle is, what that muscle is, and puts it all together to understand where it is in space. So that's proprioception. Uh, you've also got kinesthesia, which is something that doesn't come up very often, uh, but is a very, very big part of balance as well. And it's the awareness of your joint movement and position. So a lot of times when we're describing like pressure and acceleration, when we're talking about like joint receptors, kinesthesia is aware of that. Um, it's the movement that's occurring. Um, you know, if your proprioception is your, bo your body's ability to understand where it is statically, like, you know, interpret the information as like a snapshot where it is, kinesthesia is sort of the ability to do that during motion, right? Um, and this is why, like, uh, Maggie, you said it just a minute ago, when you have like vertigo, it feels like you're on a ship. It feels like you are, you know, at sea, um, which is why people get really nauseous when they have um, vertigo. Uh, that is basically like altered kinesthesia. Your body thinks that it's moving even if you're sitting still. Um, so reminding everybody what mechanoreceptors are, remember they are embedded in our connective tissue. Uh, we talked about them when we talked about like flexibility because we use uh, our mechanoreceptors to positively affect our flexibility. Um, but obviously a big part of it is our balance as well. And so mechanoreceptors detect mechanical distortions, right? They sense things like uh, length changes, like elongation. They sense compression, traction, or tension. Any of those things, um, you know, are responsible, uh, they're being sensed by mechanoreceptors. And so they send all that information to your brain in order to be interpreted. There's also some skin ones as well, uh, which are sensitive to like stretching. That's also helping your body uh, understand where it is in space. Like, um, uh, not Pacinian corpuscles, uh, is it Pacini? Uh, Ruffini endings, that's what it is. Uh, so then you also have like muscle spindles, right? They're one of the biggest ones. Muscle spindles sensitive to changes in uh, um, stretch and the rate of stretching, right? So they are sensing the length of a muscle. Um, they often are what cause your quick contractions. So remember on our first day of class, we were talking, we were talking about like stretch shortening cycles right, which is where you experience a rapid stretch and then the muscle panics, so then it contracts in the opposite direction. Muscle spindles are the ones that are responsible for that. Um, so then we also have our Golgi tendon organs. They are sensitive to sensing the tension. And I'm not putting these in your notes today because we already did them when we did flexibility a couple days ago. Um, but like mechanoreceptors that sense tension, those are your Golgi tendon organs. So the muscle spindle kind of runs throughout the, the length of your entire muscle, muscle spindle versus GTO, GTO. Um, when you look at it, like your muscle spindles kind of wrapped around uh, your entire, your muscle here, and that information's like running and sensing the length of things. Meanwhile, your Golgi tendon organs, uh, they're gonna be located in the tendons right here, right before they insert to the bone. So this guy's in charge of saying like, hey, like we are, stretch we're pulling real hard on this bone here and i can't grip it that much longer right um that is really kind of freaking out that's what senses that tension um and the same thing is true in your muscle spin your muscle spin is like hey like we can't really stretch all that much further if we go any further like parts of the muscle are going to start tearing so that is like what you you know that's the information that comes in. The problem is this guy in particular, the muscle spindle, is notorious for becoming overactive and saying, no, we can't stretch any further, when in fact it totally can. So what we do is we put pressure on this guy, that Golgi tendon organ, we put pressure either through foam rolling or just stretching actually, you know, pulling it apart. Um, and it starts to freak out because that's what it's programmed to do. But then once it realizes that there's actually a very low amount of tension, this must not be as tight as it is sending the signal. Um, you know, the Golgi tendon organ basically realizes that the muscle spindle is 
lying. Um, so what it can do is it can then override that signal. It can inhibit that overactive muscle spindle and tell it to be quiet. Um, and so, you know, we use that for flexibility, but the same thing is true for balance. Like if you are continually like balancing and like finding your equilibrium, your brain is developing the ability to use these mechanoreceptors to realize, hey, I'm in this position and hey, this position is actually very, very safe. Um, by the way, here's stretch reflexes. Like this is exactly where it happens. This is your spine right here. This is one of your spinal discs. And so your muscle spindle goes through like a little afferent and then hits here. And what will often happen is it will then uh, send the exact antagonist. It'll then send that reciprocal inhibition out to the antagonist. If this is contracting, the nervous system here in your spine realizes that and then sends it over to the antagonist to say, hey, this guy's doing the work right now, so you be quiet, you know? <laughs> um, so there's reciprocal inhibition, actually, uh, during, like, a stretch reflex. And, uh, uh, Brad, Brad uh, um, yeah. like, an effect of optimal amortization uh, period will uh, will uh, magnify the stretch, stretch shortening cycles. Yes, absolutely. So the shorter, the shorter, we're, we're going to see that today, actually. Today's, today's the day for that lesson. Um, uh, the shorter uh, the the length of like transition is, like the quicker that happens, the more explosively you're gonna you know stretch reflex in that opposite direction. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be coming back to that actually in just a minute. But yes, amortization you want it to be as quick and as short as possible. You want it over with. Um, the faster you get done with amortizing, uh, the more explosively you'll jump. Sure. Okay. Um, so here are a couple of those, uh, joint mechanoreceptors we've got, right? We've got Ruffini afferents. Uh, their job is to like extend extreme ranges of motion. You got Pacinian afferents, um, Pacinian corpuscles, uh, which is such a great name. Um, and then Golgi afferents at the, you know, sensing like, uh, the, um, range of motion of the tendon there. And then you do have nociceptors here. And those nociceptors are pain receptors. They're there to kick in once you stretch too far, you know, like, I mean, even right now, if I just like really try to extend my elbow, I start to get like a little bit of elbow pain, right? If I'm trying to like hyper extend it, I'm trying to like lock the joint out, you know, I'm grinding two of my bones here. There's a lot of like very limited space in that joint. And so my nose receptors start to kick on after a while to say like, Hey, this is an extreme range of motion. Bring it back. Um, there's also some in your ligaments as well. Uh, they're sensitive to stretching and rotation. Um, so, you know, the ligaments obviously can be torn just like any of the other stuff we've been talking about here, which is why you will often experience like altered neuromuscular control and altered balance after something like an ankle sprain, you know? Um, but their job is to also, is basically to do the exact same thing. They cause activation around a joint. Um, they cause a muscle to relax or contract. Uh, and you guys have definitely experienced this. Like, um, I know that like, uh, I've, I've actually never sprained an ankle before, uh, but I can think of a hundred thousand times where I've stepped in a hole all of a sudden and then like started to overstretch the ligaments on my ankle and my leg just goes, nope. And it just pulls it right off the ground. It's kind of a reflex. It's kind of an instinct. Um, I almost always fall afterwards, you know, um, best example of that is one day I did, uh, I got stepped on really bad at ultimate. Um, we were playing in cleats and like this guy ground the bottom of my foot. I thought, I actually remember thinking, I was like, I think I just ripped one of my toenails off. Uh, and I like went off to the side of the field, like took my shoe off and I was fine. But I was like, oh man. And then later that day, um, I was going to Trader Joe's to go shopping. And I'm zoning out. This is totally, totally my fault. Um, but I definitely ruined this woman's day. Um, so I've got groceries in one hand and I'm on my phone like the millennial that I am. Uh, and I'm texting or watching a video or something. And I'm walking through the parking lot and this lady backs up and just hits me with her car. <laughs> like hits me like, you know, kind of in the hip. And I was like, I was like, oh crap. And I went to step. And I had hurt my foot, so my foot hit the ground, which hurt really bad because I was babying it. So then my ligamentous structures immediately kicked on and they went, nope. And then my whole leg went dead. And then I just tipped over and fell <laughs> like straight back. And this, I mean, this lady who was like 
older than time, like she was time's older sister. Uh, got out of the car and was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I was like, miss, I, I don't know how to explain this to you in a very brief period of time, but number one, I'm fine. And number two, this is 100% my fault. <laughs> like, I was like, I could give you the anatomy of what just went down, but if I hadn't been stepped on earlier today, I totally would have been able to maintain my balance. <laughs> like, and I remember thinking like all of these things simultaneously, I was like trying to explain to her and she was like on the verge of tears and I felt really terrible. Um, <laughs> for the record, I mean, really, it was 100% my fault. Like I wasn't watching where I was going. Um, but that's what happened, right? Like my, my nociceptors and those ligamentous like structures that tell you when it's safe to like, when to hold them and when to fold them, you know, like uh, they either turn your muscles on or off. You have experienced this before. Almost, I'm sure everybody in this call has experienced this. If you've ever jumped off of something and like sometimes you land on the ground and like your body then goes, all right, and it goes, and then you're fine, right? Or sometimes you jump off something super high, you hit the ground and your legs literally just give out on you. It's not even so much that like you're trying to make a landing, all of a sudden your legs literally just give out and you do that like collapse thing. That is literally something we're gonna talk about when we get to plyometric training here in just a second. But Jay, that's also an example of a stretch reflex. Basically you hit the ground so hard, your nervous system went, nope. Like muscles aren't gonna be able to handle that much force. And so they literally turned them off. It is safer for you to crumple than it is for you to try to land. Um, that is a mechanoreceptor uh, thing. And usually that's your ligaments. Um, that example, the jumping example is also like your joint receptors. Um, but if it happens in a ligament, the same result will happen. Your body will basically give up um, because that is what is most safe. <laughs> And I know I'm talking about it right now in and fact, that a, but it comes a, back in, in plyometric <laughs> training here in just a second. Like I know I'm mentioning it now, um, which it, doesn't seem really relative to balance, yeah. but it's gonna be relative to the second PowerPoint. Sorry, go ahead, Jay. Nice. Is that, and is that an autonomic uh, reaction that happens in the peripheral nervous system? Yeah, so this is actually what we call a spinal reflex. Um, it is one of those situations uh, that I've mentioned before where basically it's it, it, the signal is so intense that rather than traveling, you know, it's like information goes to your spine, then it goes up to your brain, your brain interprets it, then it sends it back down and then goes wherever it's going. In this case, it got to your spine and your spine went, that's a big deal. The brain doesn't have time for this and it just made a decision for it. And that's why like it's crumpling, you know? Um, spinal reflexes are what we call simple reflexes. They are super simple. Um, they're not very fine movements. If you've ever been scared by somebody and just thrown your arm up, that's almost like a spinal reflex. Like it's very like, just, you know, <laughs> like your central, your, your central nervous system would be like, bam, you know, and it would like catch something. And so if you can maintain like that control, great. That's your brain, you know, your brain's smart. Your spine is instinctive. It is a gut decision. So Bruce Lee was the master of simple reflexes. Um, maybe. <laughs> In a sense. Yeah, certain, maybe, certain yeah. Of his, of his um, fighting style. I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, if we really want to get into like talking about specific um, major athletes from like history and stuff, uh, Bruce Lee would probably be a really good one. But like, you know, you look at some of the, you know, it's part of the thing that leads some pro athletes, especially baseball players, are a really weird example. Mm -hmm. um, a baseball travels so quickly from the mound to a catcher's mitt, um, your nervous system should not be able to interpret that information um, in that a length of time that it takes to travel. It takes longer for your brain. So like, if any mm -hmm. of us, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. Uh, unless you missed your calling. Uh, if any of us were to go like in the batter's box with like a major league pitcher, the ball would travel before our brain would see and understand where the ball is. I'm not saying that it can't see it at all, but like by time you process it here, it will be here. And by time you process it's there, it'll be here. So your nervous system is literally not fast enough. And so like baseball players are some of the fastest reflexing people uh, in sports, uh, tennis players, same situation. Um, the one of the weirdest one is badminton players. Um, that 
what it's called a shuttlecock the the birdie mm -hmm. that thing travels at like the speed of light <laughs> um so they <laughs> wonder like they wonder how humans are able to even play a sport like that um and they think that like a lot of times it's people who have fa literally faster nervous systems so they can centrally process stuff um but they also think that like through repeated exposure eventually you do develop and like talking about bruce lee you do develop uh instincts like you're you know when this happens you instantly do this in response um i'm yeah. sure anybody who's done doing like a fighting sport will tell you that i know that like when i play frisbee the second like i catch it I, I i without thinking about it transfer it to my you know inside hand like load it up for like a a, a flick um yeah. that's my more comfortable throwing side yeah yeah, you see the difference within like so, a year, you know, your body just learns to like make those reflex off the bat, you know, and then you got a beginner comes in, has never done the sport ever, and they can't bob and weave, they can't do anything and they're just getting hit, you know, and then by a year, you know, they're just so fast, they move quicker, you know, I mean, the reaction time is like amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, so that's we definitely. Would have to say that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go uh, ahead. That, uh, that Wolf, the Wolf's Law, who that definitely said that Wolf's Law would have to apply to all of it, like nervous system as well, right? Yeah. Oh, no, it actually it really does. Again, like function following form, right? You continually, you know, send your yeah. nervous system the same information. It gets better and better and better at that. That goes in the, it goes in good directions like we're talking about here, but it goes in bad directions as well. The more that you panic and stress you know the parts of your brain that panic and stress get better at panicking and stressing you know um and like the parts yeah. of you that like this is why um again like i you know i know i'm a real square here um but like we've talked about like different like drugs and alcohol and, and stimulants and things like that like don't get me wrong, like I, there are lots of benefits to certain types, you know, like beer has a lot of like uh, bacteria in it, like the good types, you know, and then like marijuana has really positive effects on the nervous system in a lot of ways. But like it, what we have to all accept is the fact that like no matter what's happening, it has some type of effect. And if you make that effect all the time, your body gets more and more, it gets better at that and worse at other things, you know? Um, so if the ever, yeah, we can talk about that some other time. Uh, <laughs> we got the nutrition mod coming up soon. It's going to come up. Uh, <laughs> so let's yeah, go. Yeah, I, think, I, mean, I think we typed, typed that in when we were doing, um, exercise psychology. Uh, yeah. Oh God. Yeah. It comes up a lot during that one. With, uh, um, cause everyone wants to yeah. know about like, they're like, what about like roid rage and stuff? You know, let's, let's talk about like, like yeah, I mean, right. like you are, you're turning on those receptors. And that's why, like, it's like people who have done steroids um, still have rage issues decades later. It's like, yeah, you grew the part of your brain that gets mad. <laughs> right. Um, right. So, anyway, all that to say, balance wise, you get better at balance the more you repeatedly expose yourself to balance, right? That is where a lot of this comes from. So it decreases your, you know, has all these really good benefits that we're seeing over here, right? It enhances your joint stabilization and posture. Um, it reduces your ability. Oh, I'm sorry, poor, I'm, I missed this, said poor balance. Poor balance will re lead to faulty movement patterns, right? And then you're gonna train to get used to those faulty movement patterns, which is not great. Um, it will lead to decreased performance and it can lead to possible injury. Proper balance reduces faulty movement patterns and makes you a more effective athlete. It increases performance and decreases your risk for injury. So, um, uh, and the way that it, the the way and the reason it does that is uh, it restores like you you know again um, neuromuscular efficiency, uh, and it's basically lots of information coming in for your brain to interpret. You're giving your brain a bigger vocabulary. That's a good way to kind of think about it. And that bigger vocabulary will allow it to do more things. Um, we call that maximal sensory input. So the ways that we enhance maximal sensory output it, or input is by, um, you know, standing on one leg or standing on a specific piece of equipment that is very squishy and wobbly. Um, so uh, 
Balance training. I love this, by the way. And it's funny. This is the same slide we saw yesterday. It's it, this slide is in all of the program design slides. This is, but it just replaces this word. It should be systematic. It should be progressive. It should be functional. And then this is the new one. It should always stress your limit of stability. Um, so uh, in order to do this, it is going to be safe and challenging. Now, balance training parameters table seven point one, which is in your books, um, is going to talk about like your um balance progression here so i do want to put that up even though it's not in the powerpoint um so your balance progression uh is going to be this uh let's go ahead and yeah it's going to start on the floor then you're going to move to a balance beam then you're going to move to an airx pad uh then you're going to move to a dyna disc and finally on to a bosu ball right and even actually bosu ball isn't even necessarily an official one um but this is your uh a year program oh wait i forgot about half foam roller oops half foam i was like where's the sagittal or the frontal plane uh roller so um here's your balance progression right uh these two are not necessarily um planes of motion, like uh, the proprioception is not being altered by any plane of motion in particular like if you're on the floor there is no, you know, alteration in your, your balance is natural, right? It's, it's however much you are simply stressing it. If you're on a balance beam, the only thing that's really messing with is because it's, you know, if you think about like standing on a balance beam on one leg, it's no different, you know, your foot's not wider than a two by four. Um, but it feels very difficult. And that's because you are focusing on that visual system, right? Um, your brain is like trying to interpret as like, I know I'm not this tall, you know? And so then that is challenging your balance just a little bit. But then we start introducing our planes of motion. So you're gonna move to a half foam roller next. Um, so let's say you're doing a single leg uh, bicep curl, you would move from the floor onto a balance beam, and then you would get on one of these little half foam rollers here. And uh, it's basically, get, it's cut in half just like this. And what it does is you can see, oh, she's doing push-ups, of course, and not doing a leg exercise. Uh, but it does rotate side to side like this, right? That is gonna introduce motion in the frontal plane, right? So that's adding one plane of movement worth of like extra proprioception. Um, so that's great, right? Like that, and you can go in the sagittal plane as well, like this version here. You can go front to back, but either way, if you're on a half foam roller, it's only introducing one plane of motion. Uh, it's either making you tilt in the frontal plane or the sagittal plane. But then we're going to progress it onto a, um, an Airx pad. And an Airx pad, which I normally have, uh, <laughs> is this basically big squishy pad. And what that does is that allows you to not only fall in the frontal plane, but you can also do a lot of motion side to side as well. So what'll happen, I'm sorry, front to back as well. Um, so you'll get like movement like this and you'll get movement like this. So you're introducing two planes of motion worth of like proprioception, right? You're sending two bits of information. Um, but then in the end, we have a Dyna disc and a Dyna disc is this squishy little um, pink disc uh, that you stand on that is like inflated uh, and it goes in all, there we go, that's a great picture. Uh, it goes in all planes of motion, right? So this is not only frontal or sagittal, it is also transverse. And so, you know, this is the most advanced of the three pieces. You will want to be pretty familiar with that progression, by the way. Um, a lot of times NASM likes to ask you questions and be like, which of the following is the next direct progression after a half foam roller? Uh, and you would say an Airx pad. Um, so that's your balance progression. Uh, we'll also see our progression for body parts, you know, like two legs stable, staggered stance stable. We'll look at that once we get to the stabilization level of um, resistance training. Um, and this stuff here, this balance progression, uh, also does apply to stabilization training as well. So you don't just have to use this only when you're in the balance movement prep section. You can also use that in resistance uh, as well. So let's say you have a client in the stable. So if we're writing a program and you get a client in the stabilization phase, uh, or it's here. No, that's not what we're doing. Uh, uh, balance training program design variables. 
done a stabilization level, which is going to be level one, and which is phase one, right? Uh, your exercise selection is going to be uh, balance, balance stabilization exercises, okay? Uh, which are defined as balance exercises that involve little to no movement of the balance leg. So they are focused on developing, um, uh, they are focused on developing stability, right? They are focused on developing like static stability, reflexive joint stabilization. Your body is reflexively responding to whatever stimulation you are giving it, right? Um, so little to no movement of that balanced leg. Uh, examples include, I have a picture? Heck yeah, I do. Uh, a single leg balance. Um, so this is a single leg balance progression. So what she's doing is at first, if you had a brand new client in the stabilization level, you would literally perform the exercise single leg balance, which is this. That's it. <laughs> That's the single leg balance. Um, but then you can start moving your arms and legs so she can move like her opposite arm, right? That's going to challenge it a little bit more. She can start moving her leg down and up. Uh, she can do both simultaneously, right? Like so. Uh, she can also do it with your eyes open or your eyes closed. That will make... Uh, that will take away your visual system and make your balance more challenging. You can also do like rotation. So this is where like the, this is actually a different exercise, but single leg hip external internal rotation. That's a really good one. And then you can have this person move slow or fast, but you'll notice no matter what I did through that whole series, I did not move my balance leg. My balance leg stayed planted on the floor the entire time and I did not bend any of my joints. I didn't have like a locked leg or anything. Um, you never want to like just lock out your joints, but I didn't move my balance leg or my lumbopelvic hip complex on the, that balance side. Okay. So that's going to be balance stabilization exercises. We'll put a couple of examples up here. We'll go single leg lift and chop. That's another good one, right? Lifting up like this, you getting a little bit of like upper body movement. And yes, you are rotating your cervical spine. You're rotating a lot of your body, but again, you're not moving the balance leg. Therefore, it is a balance stabilization exercise. Uh, then we've got our strength level here, which is going to be level two, phases two, three, and four. Um, exercise selection is going to be balance. Strength exercises, which are balance exercises that involve a full dynamic, uh, concentric, actually we start eccentric, eccentric and concentric range of motion of the balance leg. So, um, now, as long as you are moving your balance leg through a complete range of motion, that is going to be a balance strength exercise. Okay, so our examples are going to include uh, the single leg squat touchdown, right? Um, so uh, this is always kind of funny, by the way. This is the single leg squat. This is the single leg squat right here. This is the single leg squat with touchdown, um, which is funny because like we call it a single leg squat but like tell me that's not a deadlift <laughs> right like it is actually very much close more closely related to the deadlift than it is to the squat but it's got the squat in the name um so we'll say single leg squat and single leg squat with touchdown so that is now moving your balanced leg through a full range of motion so if i'm standing here uh and i simply squat down Right, that is very much the single leg squat. And then if I take my opposite arm down towards my toe, as I squat down, that is a single leg squat touchdown. Um, I absolutely love the single leg squat with touchdown. It's one of my favorite ways 
Uh, if you have a client who is asymmetrically shifting, it's one of my favorite exercises uh, to kind of get that uh, SI joint like back in alignment and get their their um, their core to to really stabilize and keep them straight. Um, really terrific exercise. Also a super great warm up if you are doing deadlifts. So if you do have a strength day and you're going to be getting into the deadlifts later on, this is an excellent activator for that. Uh, one of my one of my favorites, uh, and then we got the power level, which is level three, phase five. Uh, for exercise selection, we are going to choose balance power exercises. By the way, if I am actually moving too fast, like let me know. I just know that a lot of you guys have heard this before. Um, but these are balance exercises that involve uh, a full range of motion at functionally applicable speeds, okay? So these are uh, balance exercises that typically involve like hopping. Um, when I say hopping, I mean jumping like and landing on one leg. Um, so the classic example is the single leg hop with stabilization. Now, the original single leg hop with stabilization would literally just be this. It would just be in the sagittal plane. So what you would do is you would go here. Actually, I want to make sure that I got the, the NASA version here. Okay, yeah, she's landing on the same side. Yeah. So uh, single leg hop would be here. Blah. Damn it. <laughs> right. So there is your balance power. Uh, in the frontal plane, it would be the exact same thing. Right. Which would be here. Right. And then the transverse version uh, would be the exact same thing, except that you are going to jump and spin opening towards whatever leg you are jumping with. Um, for the record, you could also do this version here. You could also just jump and land with your opposite leg, right? Or you could land this way, right? So these are all balance exercises. Um, uh, that is a full range of motion, but I am stabilizing in the end. So we're about to get into reactive training after this. Um, and I will say like balance power exercises and reactive stabilization exercises look very similar because both of them involve like a jump and then a land and then a hold in that landed position. But the difference is because it's balance, it's all on one leg versus reactive stabilization which is explosive and then like big, big long pause and hold, but it's always on two legs. So one is challenging your balance, one is teaching you how to jump, even though both of them involve jumping. Does that make sense, guys? That's one that sometimes confuses people. All right, examples, uh, single, Single leg hop with stabilization. Single leg box jump to stabilization is another really good one, right? Um, so, uh, so if I were jumping up onto a box and stabilizing, that would also be a really good example. Um, I would just need to do it on one leg. So uh, at the end of the day, remember, uh, always select the appropriate exercises, right? If you're in phase one, balance stabilization. Phases two, three, four, balance strength. Phases five and six, <laughs> uh, balance power. And again, phase six is where you would make some specific balance, plyometric balance exercises, blah, plyometric, blah, blah, blah. Uh, balance power exercises that are directly related to whatever sport it is you are playing. Um, all right, that is that. Uh, any questions about the balance stuff, guys? Nope. No, sir. All right. Let's do the reactive stuff, shall we? So I'll stop the recording and then restart it.